What do you guys think is the number one worst chemical that you'll find in your home? Mm. Okay, and time's up, Dan. 220 frequencies programmed into this card. And when you hold this on your body, cancer goes away. Now we're finding people don't take all their birth control and they flush it down the toilet. That goes into the water system. That's not being filtered out. It gets repurposed and you're drinking that. Sun gazing, the first hour of sunrise and the last hour before sunset, resetting that circadian rhythm. What are the biggest factors that make us age faster. As good as we are in advancing technology, we're also departing greatly away from the way nature intended us to be. And that's really what I talk about when I speak about primal healing. These things are not expensive, what we're talking about. They are natural. Safe home is a really great place to start. And so what are we thinking about there? I'm a healthcare provider and I've been doing that for 40 years. And also, um, I am a bioscientist in a sense are, okay. because I've been studying energy medicine and applications of what's called bio photon modulation, which is essentially harnessing light energy, um, how it affects us on a cell level, and then how, how you can harness that and dial in certain wavelengths that do very specific things. And so it gets pretty deep on the science, but it, you know, that's sort of my area. And what I've tried to do is take fairly complicated um, physiological mechanisms and systems and just organize them, use the body to do the heavy lifting, uh, and then basically describe it in a way that a fifth year, a, a five year old can understand it and even apply our products like the way to use them, you know, very user friendly. You already said something that's interesting to me. You said, uh, let the body do the heavy lifting. What, what does that exactly mean? Can you go in a little deeper? Well, okay. So the way that in nature, the way we're organized, our way our body is organized, we have more than a dozen different systems that work um, oftentimes in harmony with one another. So if any of those systems are off for whatever reason, it could be environmental, it could be dietary choices, it could be your genetics or the or what's called epigenetics, which is the effect of your your genetics, which you really can't change, but the choices that you make and the environment you live in. So for instance, right now, um, we're experiencing in clinics that um, many women below the age of 15 are experiencing or expressing signs of infertility. And men at lower than 18 years of old have, um, have low testosterone levels. That's not a genetic proclivity. Like you're not born with low testosterone levels. That's the effect of the environment the choices in the foods that we make, our lifestyle choices and so forth, and then how those impact, how all those external um, choices in a sense impact the, the way the body operates and your genetics, okay? And so imagine like your DNA and your RNA and people have that, you know, like um, it's kind of like that twisted- uh, um, Double helix? Yeah, exactly. Um, Imagine that is a circuit board and there, there's little switches that turn, light switches that turn on and off. And that's kind of how your genetics are set up. And so you're born with a certain set of genetics and a certain switches that are turned on and turned off. And that out of, right out of the womb, um, you're armed, your body is armed with systems that work somewhat in synchroni synchronization. And then the world sets in, though that environment sets in, and it starts to turn certain switches on and turn certain switches off that could bring um, what's called a recessive trait or a um, genetic disposition, like a certain kind of way you express yourself that could be recessive, like um, may never have shown up in your entire lifetime if you lived 50 years ago. But because you're living in today's world, and those different switches are turned on and off. Now you've got these recessive um, kinds of symptoms and, and traits that are expressing themselves. And that, that concept um, basically in, on a macro level, when you kind of, kind of expand it out, is I think a, um, a very simple way to explain why the uh, chronic healthcare trends are so, 
so steep these days. And with all the research and all the money that we're pouring into cancer and, you know, and all chronic ailments like heart disease, diabetes, so forth, the big ones, um, why there's no real, um, there's no real change. We're not really making progress. Though the trends are very steep. In fact, it's um, even more alarming, at least from my perspective as a scientist, that I'm noticing that the the trends are very steep in all these healthcare challenges, and the ages that people are experiencing these healthcare challenges are coming down. So, like for instance, like maybe type two diabetes, for instance, may not have onsetted in an adult until they were in their fifties or sixties. Now we're seeing it in their thirties. Why is that? Why is a 30 year old having experiencing type two diabetes? Doesn't make sense. That's insulin intolerance. That's basically a dietary application. And there are a few things that we can do, you know, like that we can actually change. We cannot change our genetics. We're born with that. But we can change the food that this, the choice of the food that we put in our mouths, or the or the filtered or non filtered water that we drink, or the filtered or non filtered air that we breathe. These are choices that we can once we become aware that they're important to to focus on and to shift given today's world. And you know, like you guys, you live in New York City, so all the urban cities, you know, New York, Los Angeles, the big cities, and so forth. You can dial up that carbon footprint and everything that we're talking about. You can 10 exit, you know, because you've got all of that um, inherent uh, challenges that you may not have if you lived out in an urban area or a more remote area. So, so there's there's one thing you said uh, about switches. So you know, if the environment's turning the switch on, are you saying that we can get that switch back off? Yes, absolutely. Can you talk absolutely. a little bit about that? Yeah, of course. And then, and I think that that goes back to what I call primal healing, and it's what I teach. Um, kind of um, making people, the general public out there, aware that there are, you know, sort of primal elements that we all need to have in order for us to be vibrant and healthy. Now I'm talking about long term. I'm talking about being healthy from your first breath to when you first get born to your last breath, which is kind of an awkward discussion right now, because in America, we don't, that's not our model. Our model is, you know, like maybe you're really healthy till you're in your 50s or something. And then all of a sudden, you start to get a little ill, or you get exposed to a virus or whatever it might be. And then your health starts to decline. And then you get kind of drawn into our, what I consider our broken healthcare system these days, um, the more of the Western approach that involves um, um, synthetic uh, um, pharmacological uh, supplements or medicines. And then surgeries and all these other things that go along with the that process as your body starts to essentially decompensate as you're getting like older and so forth. You know, you step outside of the U.S. and I've been very fortunate in my life because as I've been developing our devices, I've spent more than 25 years traveling to Asia for more than a month a year each year, and working with factories and working with cultures and. You know, so I've seen kind of the Eastern approach to healthcare and to the balance in their lives. I've had an opportunity to visit Europe, and I've also done deep studies on um, centurion areas of the world, like the blue zones, where people live to excess of 100 years. It 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 um, regularly. It that intrigues me. Like, what is it about that environment that people just age well? And what are the the primal things that they do that we don't do in the US that, you know, causes that difference. And so that I think is really meaningful and certainly something that I'd love to share with your community. Well, you know, you said something about, you know, because uh, most of the blue zones are out of the US, but there is uh, one in California, Northern Cali, right? Um, you know, what, what have you determined by examining all these different societies and, and you know what's your take on it well there's a couple of elements like the first thing that i love is love you know generally the people that live very long have um have love in their lives have happiness in their lives have fun in their lives and they do it every day it's not just like i'm going out for fun or it's date night on wednesday so that's my fun night 
it's something that they feel is important to have as part of their um, daily routine, right? Um, movement is really important. Uh, just going for a walk and getting fresh air, communing with nature is super, super important. Uh, so I can't speak to the blue zone in California, but I can speak to two of the ones that I visited. And what I saw there was um, a very strong family unit, like extended family, like the grandkids knew their grandparents, but not just from pictures on the refrigerator. They knew them and they had, a, uh, they had an involved relationship. With, with them. And so that w worked for both the grandparents, because they got the joy and the love and the fun of the grandchild. And the grandchild got to know that know their ancestors and respect that and respect that cultural thing. Yeah. Um, what about on the flip side? What are the biggest factors you've seen that apply on the negative, like the ones that turn on the bad genes and actually make us age faster. I'm embarrassed to say that the US model is the one that is the one that jumps out like the, the most is most apparent to me. And why is that? You know, because we've driven a culture to basically think that the way we get nutrition is at McDonald's or Burger King. And so we've got these fast food, I call it a fast food kind of mentality where you're not preparing foods, their foods are, um, are generally, uh, you know, they're curated, and they don't have the same nutritional values that we had, you know, years ago. And that that actually rolls back to an environmental thing, which uh, we have some control over. But, but like, for instance, um, there's been studies that um, a friend of mine, Dr. Nathan Bryan, uh, he's an expert on nitric oxide. And uh, if you haven't interviewed him, he's the guy that you'd want to interview at some cool. point. And I can okay, hook you yeah, guys sure. up with him. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Uh, but he did a study where he um, went to, I think, a dozen states across the country and measured, took like eight ounces of broccoli, and then did the measurement of the nutritional value of the broccoli, organic broccoli in eight different states. And the range in the nutritional value went from super poor to, you know, to okay or acceptable or maybe even excellent, right? Now it's broccoli. This is all in the ounces. US? Yeah, across the US. So it's eight ounces of broccoli. You're buying it at Whole Foods or an organic you know, farm, yet the nutritional value on a cell level, like you're eating that eight ounces of broccoli, you think you're getting all those nu nutrients, but basically you're not. And why is that? Because the soils are depleted. Uh, they lack a lot of the nutrients and the bacteria, the macrobiome that is necessary in order for the plant, the fruit or the vegetable to be able to maintain that higher level of nutritional value. We're also using a lot of chemicals and things like that in farming. Glyphosates, for instance, is a really big one. And um, <clears throat> that not only um, kind of destroy the nutritional value of the crop, but also um, carry those chemicals into the body, creating a toxic environment in the body um, that also starts a cascade of hosts or hosts of different kinds of symptoms and a breakdown in that um, harmony in all those systems that I mentioned earlier today. So when you have systems that are synchronized and you have a beautiful environment and you've got good nutrition, like <laughs> you live healthy from the first breath to the last breath, but is that America, you know? I mean, maybe out in some farm states, like I, last week I was in, uh, we have an organic farm in Michigan and it's in a little, it's a very rural area. Uh, we just actually waited more than 24 months to have the electric company come in to bring special power to a manufacturing facility that we're building there. And, and that's how rural it is. And it's, um, it's in an enclave of Amish, uh, Amish enclave where people, you know, like are still practicing the same kind of farming they have for more than 100 years or 100 years ago. So you see these Amish guys with black hats, black jackets, you know, long hair and so forth, you know, whatever their garb, their dress is, you know, and um, they're driving a half a million dollar John Deere tractors. But behind that, they're carrying an oxbow that their father and their father's father used you know, to till the soil. Okay, so it's kind of like, whoa, right. But um, there, you know, they're delivering children with midwife, 
midwifery, midwifery. It's not done by C-section like in the hospitals today because, you know, women don't have the, in modern worlds. I'm not saying, I'm not talking generally now. I'm just talking in some cases. So, and understand when I'm talking to you guys today, I'm not coming from a place of judgment. It, this isn't like my feelings. I'm just reporting it to you from what I can see and what I see that um, are the things we can correct and the things that we just have to be aware of that we can really dial in to make a big difference in our overall health and vitality. So if the end game and the goal is for us to be healthy, like, and, and health, <clears throat> I define health on a cell level. So I believe that if you can do everything in your power to maintain the constitution of cell, of a cell health, of a single cell in your body, then we get sick when that cell starts to break down and doesn't operate properly and we heal the same way. And so imagine one cell is sick and then the next cell is sick and then the next cell and the next cell and the next cell and so forth. And now all of a sudden we have a symptom. Now, if we reverse that and we do things that can support cell health, then we reverse that trend and then all the systems start to line back up. And it's really beautiful to see. And I, I've been practicing this in clinic for more than 40 years. It's almost like watching an orchestra tune up. That's how beautiful it is. So you've got this sick person that comes to you that's symptomatic. And, you know, we know that there are certain systems off. We do some of the analytics, by the way, I, I, I'm, I sort of created a bad rap for the Western medicine, but there are some really amazing things about Western medicine also like measuring things. Oh yeah. Like the clinical yeah. stuff and the, and the, um, the amount of testing and the lab reporting and some of that technology is so amazing in giving us the ability to understand some of the root causes that are, that are challenging people these days. But, but what I, what I find is we're living in a world of what I call reductionism. And that is, that we're trying to constantly reduce the us to the micro level to the single root cause that causes your your challenge and it's not it doesn't work like that in your body it, everything the, a lot of the systems are codependent on one another and if one is off it affects the other one that affects the other one that affects the other one and so that's why i love primal healing because when we just start from the concept of cleaner air, water, food, and sunlight. If you can just harness those concepts and try to maintain the highest level of constitution in those love, those areas, then the body will start to respond and tune up again on a cell level. So, you know, awesome. So to summarize, you know, we've got in this modern day age, we've kind of left the way that we used to do things. Uh, we're eating bad food. There's toxins everywhere and these things are harming us. So, I mean, I, myself, I'm an extreme guy. I've thought about becoming Amish myself, like, seems like that's the way to go. Um, but short of that, what, you know, what are the things we can do? You mentioned clean air, sunlight, fresh air, like how do we do those things? Okay. Well, I think the first thing is to create a safe place. So I love the idea of your house or your home, your apartment being your safe place. So start there because, you know, if your sleep is an important issue too. And so if you can get six to eight hours of good sleep and maybe two to three hours of that to be um, where you're in what's called Delta or deep sleep or restorative sleep, then you're really ahead of the game because again, the back to the cell level, we need that rest. We need that restoration. We need the, that, when the brain gets in and generally between the hours of 12 and four in the morning, uh, when you can be in that deep restorative sleep is when the brain actually um, shrinks a little bit. <clears throat> it gets flushed with spinal fluid that it's almost like a car wash for the brain. So the brain starts mm -hmm. the detox. It also um, generates enzymes and hormones for restoration like growth hormone and serotonin and melatonin are hormones that the brain um, produces and that creates a, 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 a deep sleep cycle. And again, it gives the systems a chance to rest a little bit. And then when you wake up the following day, <clears throat> you actually can wake up strong and healthy. Um, your, ba your body batteries are recharged. Uh, your mitochondria, once we get a little bit of sunlight, you know, infused into the 
discussion, they get recharged. That's, a, that's your cell battery. <clears throat> and then when you, you're all charged up and you've got a good, you, your systems are synchronized, then you're basically ready to conquer the world, you know? And so that makes us more adaptable to the, to the bad environments that are, that are around, you know? So back to safe home. Um, we live in controlled environments, right? You guys, I, I don't know if you're in homes or in the city, in, in, uh, in apartments in the city, but you have air conditioning, you have heating. Um, and if you're in an apartment, you can go from your heated apartment now that it's winter to your heated garage, to your heated car, to driving along to the, your heated office mm -hmm. or garage, heated office and so forth, right? So everything yeah. is controlled. That's not the way nature intended us to be just dial it back 8,000 years in the days of Moses, Jesus, and Buddha, right? In those days, we lived in caves, we lived in tents, we lived on the land, we woke up to sunrise. We didn't wake up to the sound of an alarm clock. Okay, so that's a very different, a very different discussion. Because when you are synchronized with, and, and by the way, you know, I'm just going to overarch this discussion with uh, optimal results versus practical. So, you know, if you got to get up at seven in the morning to get to your job, you need, you may need an alarm clock. So that's practical, get your alarm clock. But if you don't, and you can wake up naturally, I don't use an alarm clock. I get up at 4.30 in the morning. I get up when my body tells me when to get up. Wow. That could be three o'clock or four o'clock or five o'clock in the morning. I just get up because I'm done. I'm ready to wake. Okay. And, uh, and then um, the sun rises. And the sun sets a, a bio clock in your body. It's called your circadian rhythm. And so when that, when you're in rhythm with nature, then all of your systems are also in rhythm with nature and then you're more synchronized. So back to the flip side, you're up partying all night. It's two, three in the morning. You have to set an alarm because you need to get up for the next day. You haven't gotten a full rest. You haven't gotten restorative uh, enzymes and growth hormones and things that help the body repair from the damage the environment's done from the day before. You're coming in already at a deficit, okay? Right. And then you start to do your day. The day's stressful. You're, you're eating, breathing, and drinking, you know, pretty much uh, polluted, um, the polluted environment. So all those features, even as good as we are, it's still got um, challenges with toxins, right? And then what happens is the body has filtration systems like the liver, the kidney, the pancreas, um, um, your lymphatic system is also a, a form of a, a way to filter things out. Um, and so those systems are designed to basically catch a lot of the impurities of the environment and keep the body cleansed. But in today's world, particularly again, back to the urban settings where you're bombarded and imagine you're not coming in completely on, on, you know, with 12 cylinders fired in your engine because of the night before that's not a good amount of sleep. You walk outside and you're still, you're breathing pollution. You're, you're getting exposed to all those things. And now it, imagine if that was day after day after day, after a certain point, you know, you guys were pretty young, but as you get a little bit older, that starts to your body's ability to actually maintain a vital constitution starts to decline because it's just bombarded with toxins. We we're not aware and doing the right and all the right things we can to detoxify ourselves so that we have, you know, kind of a, a good revolving door of the body's systems being able to maintain the constitution. So without the awareness, which is today's discussion, like what, what, what can we do to change all this stuff, right? And I'm gonna give you all those pearls as, as I promised when we started. Um, but the first thing is, it's like, what's going on guys? Like what's the, what's the challenge here? And so the challenge is in, we're being led by um, advertising uh, that eating these certain foods are okay for us. And so we depend on the government and um, and our communities to think that they're going to do the right thing by us and make sure that we don't get hurt. And basically what we've discovered, maybe it wasn't necessarily COVID, but just in general, there's an awareness that maybe the government isn't more money motivated and less uh, 
or more opportunist than actually thinking about what's the best for Alex or for Dan, right? And so, so understanding that, you know, kind of shifts the, um, the burden on us as individuals and me as a teacher and you guys as documentarians to put the word out, to make people instill ideas uh, and stimulate thought about maybe there's different ways and maybe you should consider this again without judgment you guys make your own choices but but to make a choice or to make an informed choice that might be a better way to kind of look at it and then all right so healthy home um there's an amazing guy named darren olin who also is another a friend of mine that i would suggest that you kind of take a look at uh, he's got a very big podcast and he just wrote a book called fatal fatal conveniences and basically it's about the things that we find in our home, like the chemicals that are that we use in our household that we just think are okay because the EPA is opined on it, the FDA is opined on it, everybody's put their rubber stamp on it, but yet that chemical sits under your countertop. And when your body gets exposed to it, then it starts to break us down internally, right? Now, if it was just one thing, we probably wouldn't be even having this discussion and we'd have no reason to talk today, but it's everything. It's all these things. And so I love the safe house because if you know anything about electromagnetic fields, EMF, then you can, you can go around your house and turn off your wireless networks and you can where you can wire things rather than it being wireless, you might go that way. You guys are biohackers, so everything is, you know, like gaming faster and looking for the wireless this and that or the electric bike or electric car and all that. And I love that technology, but there's a price you pay for it. And again, it's back to as good as we are in advancing technology, we're also departing greatly away from the way nature intended us to be in the animal kingdom and in the plant kingdom. And that's really what I talk about when I speak about primal healing. So back to the healthy home. What do you guys think is the number one worst chemical that you'll find in your daily, in your home, just that you use every day or you use three times a week? What do you think that would be? I mean, you know, I know PFOS is, is horrible, but that's like in everything. So it's not something we're using on a daily basis, but I would think like maybe bleach, you know, or, you know, maybe the toothpaste or something, you know, or the That's water good. even because like, you know, I like that. Dan, yeah. you want to give it a stab? I was going to say PFAS, but um, you're saying something we actually used. Yeah. It's something that you guys buy, <clears throat> you'd buy at your Publix or at your normal food, you know, food store or your, um, you know, where you guys get food and, um, you know, uh, things for the house, stuff like that, like paper goods, all that, you know, um, and that you might utilize, you know, routinely twice, three times a week, something like that. Some kind of something, something like that. Mm. What do you think it might be? Mm. I don't have any guesses. Okay. And Some sorry. sort of household cleaner, Windex? Yeah, actually, it's pretty close. It's laundry detergent. Uh. Okay, so what's in laundry detergent? You've got a coloring and you've got a fragrance and that fragrance is designed so that after you're done washing your clothes, um, it leaves a coat on the thread. Now that thread that's coated with a chemical is going on your skin. It's on your underwear. It's on your t-shirts, right? And so you're absorbing that through your skin into your butt bloodstream. And, you know, like it's, it seems simple or it seems, you know, like why can't they figure out like how to make a laundry detergent that doesn't have chemicals in it, you know, that will clean my clothes, but not also um, hurt me or make me more toxic. Again, it's back to if it was just laundry detergent, we wouldn't be having the same kind of discussion today, but it's the compounding of all these different elements. And what's the trigger that's going to actually um, uh, set off Alex systems, like his epigenetics? What is that switch that's going to switch that's going to turn that's going to make him symptomatic and maybe you not symptomatic so you have two guys you eating the same food maybe living in the same household yet dan you may not be symptomatic and alex you might be very symptomatic why is that 
Well, it's funny that you say that because, you know, recently on the trip we met you, when we were in Vegas, the whole team stayed in a hotel. And the next morning, everyone's like, oh, my head's scratchy, I'm itchy, I'm this and that. Some people's chests were burning out and it was, you know, we determined it was the, the sheets, you know, in the bed. It must have been something they used. Um, and it took days for us to recover from it, you know? Yeah, totally. I totally get so. it. Yeah. All right. So safe home is a really great place to start. And so what are we thinking about there? Like filtering the air, filtering the water that we drink and then we cook our food and we bathe in because people think that the only way you get water into your body is by drinking it, but you absorb more water through your skin when you're taking a bath or a shower than you do just drinking a glass of eight ounces and you know, whatever, if you drink a lot of water. Right. Any um, specific filters that you recommend? Well, uh, for water filtering, um, we, we make one, but it's a very simple filter. I like reverse osmosis. I like distilled water. But the challenges with many of those filtering systems is they do take particulates out and fluorides out, but they also make the water what's called dead water in the water industry, meaning that it doesn't, it's not bioavailable on a cell level. I keep reflecting how things affect us on a cell level because it's super important. And so the cell, each cell has a membrane around it and it's a permeable membrane. Yeah. So it allows the cell to get to export tox toxins and um, waste materials. And it also, that same membrane allows the cell to get um, water and fluids in and nutrients in, okay, minerals and so forth. And that's basically that, that function. Now, if that cell wall is impaired, let's say it's clogged, so it can't get um, waste products out. Now you've got a cell in distress. Again, breaks down on a cell level. You get enough of those cells in distress, they either die off or they become liver cancer or they become some greater challenge because it's been left unaddressed for too long of a time. I'm not just talking about a one day event, I'm talking about years of buildup. And the challenge here is again, you guys are young. So when you're young, you've got so many more things going on that are compensating for all the deficits. So you don't really feel the net change um, because your brain is designed to try to take all of these variables that affect us every day now I'm talking about trillions of kinds of data input and then analyze it and then give you a kind of a smooth uh, um, uh, departure from the tunnel. So it, it's chaos going in with earth elements and, and um, all of the challenges with the toxic world. It gets all of that stuff, all that information, tries to balance it out. And that's called homeostasis is basically that balance, internal balance in the body so that when you come out, of the other end of the tunnel that you're somewhat like, you know, feeling okay or feeling normal. Okay. Now that works for a while until that system starts to break down because the brain is on overload. There's too much information coming in. There's not enough processing going on and the body's systems are starting to break down. So they're not working as efficiently. And so that backup creates a symptom or creates a challenge. Yeah, the great thing about Alex and I is we're both very sickly people since a young age. So because of that, our... It's a great thing, yes. <laughs> it's a big, great blessing in disguise, I think, because because of that, we can sense things very quickly, whether they're good or whether they're toxic. You know, if you're really healthy and you go to a hotel with fabric softener, you won't necessarily be able to tell because your body's young, healthy, but we're young and sick, so we're able to detect stuff. So that's the way the positive that I see in it. So I can attest to all these things you're saying because we've experienced them on a yeah, daily basis. Yeah. yeah. Um, as sad as I am that you guys are experiencing that at a young age, I'm happy that you're tuned into it because that's going to be your guiding light. That's what's going to pull you guys out of the, of, you know, from the abyss in a sense, because because think about everybody else out there that's not like you, like you didn't have a health challenge. So you're kind of taking everything for granted that, you know, the governments and people are going to protect us and they don't, that the foods and so forth that we're eating are nutritious and they aren't, you know, the water we're drinking and the air we're breathing is clean and it isn't like they're just assuming that, you know, if it's coming from your faucet, that the municipality that has, you know, altered that water somehow is giving you clean and good drinking water. But then you've got Flint, Michigan, where they discovered that the pipes were eroding and that the kids in high in grade schools 
have um, met, um, cognitive challenges because of the high levels of mercury and lead in the water because the pipes were eroding. And you're depending on the government. Well, you're sending your kid to school thinking that they're going to be safe and that they're, you know, and so you be healthy and vibrant and so forth. And it isn't the case. It's really on us. Okay. And, and <clears throat> as a storyteller and as a bio researcher and as an older person feeling dedicating his life to trying to raise awareness and, and um, help people with their health challenges. But mostly what I love is your category, not the sick young people, but the young people that are, that are vibrant, that I can hopefully instill some of these concepts in, with or two that um, then will grasp them, incorporate them in their lives, and then kind of shift that the way things were being done to a healthier, a healthier um, in direction in a way. Right. Can we can we revisit the water for a minute? Because, you know, you, you talked about, um, you know, RODI and pulling out, you know, too much out of the water. I know there are gravity filters like Berkey's. Is there is there a middle ground or what? What You know, I felt like you didn't complete that thought. Can, can you give us the rest of that? Yeah, of course. Um, all right. So let's unpack the way water again. Let's go back to nature because that's the playbook. OK, so how does water, you know, like the way nature intended water to be? What is that? What's the definition of that? So it starts gravity with, through the soil. Well, in a way, that's through. one. That's the end phase. But let's start at the very top of the mountain. So we get precipitation from a cloud. The elevation of the mountain is high enough. Let's say it's 10,000 feet. So the elevation um, puts the water on top of the mountain that's coming fr basically from a cloud from rain. Right. And so right now you'd see it as a snow capped mountain. And then the sun rises in the morning and the warmth of the sun and the certain frequencies of wavelengths of sun start to melt that snow capped mountain. And then now, even though you may not see it at the very top of the mountain, but what hap that's happening under that snow is it starts, the melted water starts to trickle down. Gravity starts pulling back down the mountain and it starts with just you know little drops and then it turns into a little stream. Then it turns into a bigger stream. Then it turns into a river. Then it turns into uh, maybe an estuary that dumps into um, an ocean or uh, into a sea. Okay, so what's happening with that water coming down the mountain? It's meandering around rocks and stones. It's picking up minerals. It's being influenced by sunlight, so it's being restructured. It's got energetics and vortex. It's got all that stuff going on, and then it ends up dumping down to a stream or coming down from a waterfall. Right now, compare that to what you drink in your apartment or your house in New York City. It's coming down a PVC pipe or maybe even a metal pipe. Uh, even if that water was structured at one end of the pipe, when it gets 200 feet away from that, whatever that element is that's structuring that water, it loses its structure. Okay, so sunlight. And this is the work of um, Dr. Gerald Pollack, who is probably the world's authority on water, who wrote a book called The Fourth Phase of Water about maybe 10 years ago. And he discovered that there are certain rays of sunlight that when it hits the water molecule, it actually re rechanges the shape of the water. And it kind of imagine it being like uh, dominoes. The water in the body, in order for us to, to best communicate on a cell level, it has to be set up in structure, meaning that it's that all the water molecules, the singlet water molecules are lined up and they all look exactly the same. Um, um, Mizuro Emoto wrote a book. OK, and he started the whole thing on structured water because he took water. He set intentions by just, you know, thought intentions into the water. Then he froze the water and he looked under a high micro, high powered microscope and he saw really these beautiful um, crystalline snowflake that's structure. Okay. When all of those snowflakes look exactly the same. And now imagine having those dominoes or the snowflakes lined up in your body from tissue to tissue. Now all those water molecules carry information. It carries nutrients. It carries energy, right? And it's the transport system that the cell needs in order to get things in and get things out of a cell for it to properly operate or be healthy. It's called methylation, probably methylate. All right. Now, 
when we go back to our living, our normal, whatever normal is these days, our modern approach to water, you're getting it from a PVC pipe. It's got no structure in it. It's got all the chemicals that the municipality puts in the water to try to um, keep the bacteria levels down. Uh, they're also dumping fluorides and there's no reason for fluorides to be in the water, but that's what they put in the water these days. So there's a whole challenge with that in itself. And now we're finding even trace amounts of, um, of uh, chemicals and pharmaceuticals in the water. So people don't take all their birth control and they flush it down the toilet that goes into the water system. That's not being filtered out and you want, it gets repurposed and now it's coming down through your faucet and you're drinking that. Not so good for us. This is very far from the way, I'm just talking about the disparity of the way nature intended water to be and the way that we're, it's being delivered today. So knowing that it's, knowing how, you know, maybe we can't live on a Hawaiian island like Kauai where 75% of it's uninhabited because it's still volcanic, right? So you've got beautiful waterfalls and you've got nature all around you. Maybe we don't have access to that, but if we do know that we do need to have structure and we do need to have filter filtration and we do need to have the proper minerals in the water. We can do all that and we can do that in the modern world today. So you can take your municipal water and then you can move it through an RO system or a, dist a distilled system. That's going to take everything out. And then you just have to put some things back in in order for you to make it bioavailable and you're back on track. So it what about sounds the like a lot part? of work. It sounds like a lot of work, but it really isn't, honestly. What were you saying, Dan? Um, yeah, and what about the structuring part? How do yeah. we restructure the water? Yeah, you need. You actually need. Um, you need sunlight for that, uh, and and or earth energy, which isn't what's called negative ions. The earth has actually a charge to it, so you need either the earth charge or you need the sun charge, and that's that will restructure the water in your body. We, we, we can't just tell it we love it. You can tell it you love it. And that will always work, Alex, by the way. Okay. And I have a, a close friend that um, when I told on stage a story about structured water, as I'm telling you guys, he said to me, oh my God, I didn't even realize this, but like uh, he had two little young kids then and he would buy like Zephyr Hills five gallon water, you know, deliver it. And every time he got one, he'd take a, um, a magic marker and he'd put a big happy face on the jug of water on the outside. And when the kids would come up and they would take their water, they'd be looking at the happy faces and all the things that he drew on it. And they'd be smiling and laughing and, and do all that. And that energy, that intention is being actually inputted into that water. So, I love it, man. Yeah, yeah. It's totally the way to go. So these things are not expensive. What we're talking about, they are natural and they are very easy to achieve. Even in our modern world, the first step is to understand how far we departed, what's important, you know, to organize, and then to take some measures, some steps to get yourself back on track. So, so um, water is a big one. Um, the next would be air filtration. I think that's super important. And uh, the, the challenge there is first that we have challenges with the air pollution, but the other part is that there's very high concentrations of mold in our environment these days. And it's not just the coastal cities anymore, it's everywhere. So, so, um, and mold again, by itself is there's, you know, tens of thousands of variations of, of that, uh, organism, but there's probably less than a hundred that are detrimental to your health. And there's in modern apartments and, um, like, uh, houses and so forth, there's probably less than, less than, uh, 20 or 30 that may, may have a dramatic impact on your health. So that's a very simple thing you can do in your home get a mold test. You don't need to bring in a uh, people with hazmat suits and, you know, um, all these chemicals that they spray that do that aren't really doing the job, but they say that they're doing the job for you, you know. Um, but you can test it yourself, you can get a petri dish. And there's actually a company called got mold that we work with, that has a really brilliant um, way to capture the the mold that's in your uh, in your home. And you test your rooms. And then you can look at a chart and see, or send the the, the uh, collection device into a lab. <clears throat> for I'm talking about less than a hundred dollars. You can test your home and see what you're living, what kind of mold you're living in that's living in your home. And if you've got some bad kinds, then address those, remediate those, 
as opposed to living and breathing in that moldy environment with mold that's bad for your health. And then at some point you become toxic inside because the mold spores are, are um, actually um, generating, you know, like it's an organism. And so they are living inside of you and they're breeding inside of you. And then they're, what are they doing? They're dying and that's a toxin and, or they're pooping and that's a toxin. And what else are they doing? They're using a part of your life resources. So you can kind of very easily determine for not a lot of money, what that looks like in your home environment and remediate it. Okay. So do you, do you, do you have an opinion on ozone generators in regards love, to this? Yeah. Yeah. I love ozone. We work with ozone. It's really the bigger category is oxygen therapy. So ozone is one approach. The other would be hyperbaric uh, where you're taking oxygen and sort of forcing it through your skin. Um, but um, one of the reasons why we age prematurely and or age at all is because of oxidative stress. So as we get older, our body's ability, our blood's ability to hold on to oxygen starts to diminish. And so if you, if you want to, a great longevity profile would be to slow down the aging process by making sure that your, your blood oxygenation uh, level is like 98%, pretty high, right? Um, through the pandemic, uh, and many of the hospitals, they have a, uh, procedure that if your blood oxygenation level gets below 90, um, 90, uh, percent that they throw you on a ventilator. Okay. It's, that's crazy. Like, and especially through the pandemic, because many of the reasons why people had, um, hypoxia or didn't have enough oxygen in their, in their bloodstream didn't have it, anything to do with um, the virus per se. Okay, but they still came in to the hospital door, and they were calibrated below and they put them on ventilators forcing air into their blood when their blood wasn't positioned to be able to even hold on to the air. So it was it was just a, a very awkward situation, you know, and it affected many families, unfortunately, it, let's reverse that back out. What can we do? Well, Going for a good healthy walk is a really great way to just get your metabolism moving. And when you're walking and you're exercising, um, bike riding, stuff like that, you're just breathing a little bit more, um, like more rhythmic and maybe deeper breathing. And that's a way to just bring more oxygen through your lungs and through the alveoli that are little air sacs in your lungs that dissipate that oxygen into your, into your bloodstream. And so, um, after the age of around 28, between 28 and 30, our bodies start to make less nitric oxide. Earlier, I mentioned a guy named Dr. Nathan Bryan, a friend of ours, and he's probably the world's authority on nitric oxide right now. And he makes a supplement, it's a lozenge. Uh, and basically, as after the age of 30, because we make less nitric oxide, what nitric oxide does is it triggers your blood to grab more oxygen. So if you make less of it, then your blood um, inherently will grab onto less oxygen. And so that's one of the reasons why we age from what's called oxidative stress. So if we could somehow um, build up the level of nitric oxide now we're, and also at the same time, go for a good healthy walk, we're now got the blood ready to receive more oxygen and the body delivering more oxygen just by breathing normally or a little bit, you know, more accelerated because you're doing some exercise. Again, not expensive great way to extend your life. Everybody listening today, that's tip number four. Um, and uh, yeah, inexpensive and a great way to, to focus on your health and longevity. You talk about oxygen. Uh, what are your thoughts on hydrogen? Hmm. Uh, we're doing more studies on it now. There is, uh, well, I, I, I want to complete the, oz you mentioned Dan, uh, Alex about ozone because what I just talked about was oxygen in general. Uh, ozone is different than regular oxygen that we're breathing. Ozone is by definition O3. It has an extra oxygen molecule attached to it. The, the air that we breathe is O2. In the environment, in our atmosphere, in our stratosphere, there's actually what's called an ozone layer. And there's a reason why that ozone isn't, that we're not breathing O3, that we are breathing O2. Because ozone O3 um, is nature's disinfectant, that extra oxygen, uh, 
is important uh, on, for a few reasons, because one, one of the reasons is, <clears throat> again, in our modern day, many people are symptomatic because they've got an imbalance of, of microbes, of little organisms that live inside the body. And they live in harmony. Like there are more than 60,000 different kinds of bacteria that just live inside our gut and are, are important for us to have that, those organisms there to help us pre-digest our food. Okay. Now, those are the good beneficial organisms. What about the ones that aren't so beneficial, like mold, like Lyme, like viruses, like certain non-beneficial bacteria? When Parasites. they yeah, parasites. When they're brought into the same host, our same internal environment, they're doing the same things that all the other guys are doing. You know, they're eating our food, they're pooping and they're dying. Okay. But for some reason, some people, their internal climates are perfect storms for the breeding of certain kinds of these organisms. And there becomes an imbalance. And when they start to get overrun, with a certain organism, then you start to get more toxic and more symptomatic. Now, how do we reverse that? Oxygen. Most of those organisms are anaerobic, meaning that they don't need or use any or very little oxygen in order to survive. So when you start to super oxygenate your blood or bring your oxygen, blood oxygenation level up to that 97, 98, 99% level, now these organisms they they have nowhere to hide because that extra oxygen that extra o is actually going to start to bring back the population and bring it more in harmony like with everything everybody else so again um it's a it, these are different systems that rely on one another the lack of oxygen like when we're couch potatoes and we're not get active and we're getting older right and we're not making enough nitric oxide and our blood oxygenation levels start going down and we start um, getting more oxidative stress. At the same time, we have these microorganisms and some of them, we're exposed to all of them. Like I said, we're exposed to mold, we're exposed to parasites in our food, we're exposed to many of these organisms that are non-beneficial and they get inside of us. And now this, that's still perfect storm inside our bodies. They get to be able to populate out of control which is their job. They only have three jobs. One is to, um, to use, find a host and, and, uh, and, you know, get that life resource. The other is to, um, basically make babies. And the third is to, is just to poop. Okay. That's their, that's how simple their lives are, but they want to survive just like we want to survive. And so a way to keep this in balance is just to go back to, getting some fresh air and making sure the constitution of our blood oxygenation level is high enough so that we're back in check now shifting. So ozone is a great way to do that. And we use ozone. We use it in our portable sauna. I made a ozone device that you can put in the sauna. And the reason why I did that is because when you start to sweat in that portable infrared sauna, you're opening up and pulling toxins out. That sweat is actually a great way to get rid of about 85% of the toxins in your body. But at the same time, the skin becomes an accentuated breathing organ. So there's two ways to get oxygen into your blood through your nose and your mouth, and through your skin. Okay. And so, so if your skin is letting go of toxins, and at the same time, you're exposing the environment inside the sauna with a higher oxygenation um, environment, meaning that there's ozone in that tent, now through your skin is going to get that extra O that's going to go right into your bloodstream. That's going to then start to rebalance your internal melu or your terrain or your micro microbiome. Is it so, safe to breathe in ozone? Well, it's you know, a the, good the government <clears throat> yeah, specifically yeah, yeah. EPA says like it's dangerous and whatnot. Yeah. And, and basically they're right. <laughs> okay. So ozone, what they're referencing is what's called clinical grade ozone. So clinical grade ozone um, is a higher gamma concentration. That's a higher concentration of oxygen to uh, free air. So there's two components in clinical grade. What we make, and, and so the higher the gamma, the more um, uh, the more uh, ir of an irritant is to your breathing tech, uh, pathways and to your skin. So a great test is if you go near an ozone device and you breathe it in directly and you cough, 
Now you know it's irritating your breathing pathway. That's not good for you. Our devices uh, are very low gamma. So they give you extra oxygen, not a very high concentration. But again, when you're in a sauna for 30 minutes and you're sweating out your poisons, you can slowly bring this extra oxygen through your skin, which is more sustainable. I like low and slow. I'm not a fast food guy, you know? Like you, you guys are young again, and you, you know, you express that you're symptomatic. So, but like, sometimes it takes 10 or 20 years for people to build up that toxic burden and load inside their bodies before they become symptomatic. Right. Yet in our fast food approach to the world, we, it takes us 20 years to get sick, but we think we can take a magic pill or something. And then in two days, we're going to get well again. No, no. So, but if the things we're talking about are simple ways to just shift and alter our lifestyles, our home environments, you know, that can really get us right back on track. And then again, it's a slow process, but we start, our systems start to come online little by little, and then they start to work more in synchronous little by little. And then we have our primal platform back again, and we're healthy and we're vibrant and thriving. That's such a good perspective. Um, you know, I've been detoxing my body for the, very seriously for the past five years. And I like to do things very extreme. Um, you know, I was doing chelation with ALA and DMSA. I was pushing the dose as high as possible. And I actually got some really bad reactions that set me back because it was very, very, very tough. And so someone told me, you know, when it comes to health, slow is fast and you got to take it easy. You know, sometimes you think you, I'll push the dose higher and I'll get results faster, but it's actually, you know, it, you actually set yourself back by putting too much burden on yourself. Totally. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And again, if it was just one thing, Dan, you know, you probably could have managed it, but you got a lot of other things that are operating at the same time. Right. And where are you coming from, from the beginning? Like you're wanting to do the detox because you're already symptomatic your body's expressing itself. So you're already compromised. And so your body is stressed. It's showing you that by, by expressing a symptom, any symptom. Now you're giving it more stress by trying to unwind it and do it in a faster way because that serves your lifestyle, but doesn't necessarily serve your body as an organism. So there I would always sort of default to low and slow. And even in our own protocols, we we kind of set up like a general approach based on how you're expressing yourself and how um, symptomatic you are and what your cha challenges you, you have. Um, and then we give you that protocol. And then what we try to do is just kind of track you for as much as 12 weeks and just see how your body's adjusting and kind of fine tune it. And during that 12 week process, um, you get to experience enough of your life cycles so that you can learn how to adjust for yourself, self-regulate, which I think is really the major power of our discussions today. What kind of information can we give to the community that's gonna empower them so that they can self-regulate, so that they know what tools to pull out and how to calibrate what tool to use and how much to use of that tool in order for them to get back on track. Awesome. We've talked about water, we've talked about air. Can we talk about sunlight? I think it gets a bad rap because we put on sunscreen, we wear sunglasses, we're like, ah, sun. So what's the deal with sun? Yeah. So that's a very popular belief. And that's the challenge. We're talking today about altering beliefs and perceptions, right? The narrative. So we're being taught at an early age, don't go in the sun. I live in South Florida and here it's pervasive. You're going to get skin cancer. You're going to get all these things. The research shows just the opposite. Actually, there are in sunlight there. Um, I have a classic slide that I produced that I'm more than happy to give you content, by the way, if you guys want to put slides into stuff uh, anyway. Um, and it just shows the, the sun and it shows the planet Earth. And basically as the Earth is turning and then also as it's rotating on its axis, that's called the azimuth. So the angle of the sun to the Earth. And then as the Earth is turning, it, it, we have different wavelengths of sun energy hitting a location at different times of the day. Okay. So you can go in, let's say in the morning, 
um, mostly the UV spectrum, which is the um, the area of light energy that will produce uh, change the pH of your body, of your blood. That's important. Most systemic diseases aspire in acidic blood environments. So if we can do anything to to raise the alkalinity or change the pH to be more towards pH neutral, 7.0, that's going to be really good for long-term health. And all it's going to sort of force all the pathogens and diseases to move out of your body. Again, not a short-term play, but it's something that we, that we can do. We can shift that. And green leafy um, foods are, and or um, chlorophyll is a great supplement. Like that green leafy kelp, like that type of food source is a great way to get um, to shift your pH. And then you can test it with litmus paper just on your tongue. You can see that it's moving from the yellows to the blues and greens. And it's quite easy to do and, and it just takes a little bit of time. But again, uh, better food choices and just being aware that you can shift that makes a big difference. Um, uh, <sighs> I know, I know. If, I'm sorry if I'm a, a point, Dan. What was your? That's okay. Was, it's all great. Uh, sunlight. Sunlight. So, in so cancer, the early <clears throat> parts of the day is super important. Again, I'm back in Florida, so here they want you to lube up with carcinogenic sunblockers. Uh, they're 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 offering suggestions that are not healthy. Actually, what you pointed out about wearing sunglasses, sun gazing, the earliest, like the first hour of sunrise and the last hour before sunset, you can actually stare right into the sun. And I would recommend that, that but I, you have to start off really slow, like five seconds, then 10 seconds. You can build up to a minute or two, but that will, that, that light wavelength and intensity is amazing at shifting your body chemistry, but mostly using your your eye, your retina to bring that light energy and to shift your brain waves. And it just has an amazing result. That's called sun gazing. Yeah, I've been um, doing it, actually. Okay. And yeah, there's no damaging UV at that time. Actually, the closer you get to sunset and sunrise, it's quite easy because it's not that bright. It's just that nice orange. Yeah, fantastic. Color. And so it's, it's, yeah, really, it's yeah. amazingly refreshing. But what you're doing there isn't just bringing more light into your brain and into your cells, but it's also resetting that circadian rhythm, that, that bio clock inside you. That's so important because that clock regulates many of the systems in your body. And so when people are sick, like we deal with chronic Lyme disease, their clocks are way off. Like when they get woken at one or two in the morning to go to the bathroom, they can't go back to bed. Their, their bodies are up and they should be, that's when they should be sleeping and getting that restorative sleep. And so they're just the opposite. They're flipped over. And then when the sun rises, they fall dead asleep. It's just, you know, so getting back in rhythm with the planet, with nature and the sun cycle and moon cycle, super important. Um, so, uh, so the, so sunlight is a really important thing. You just mentioned that the other part is skin. People are worried about getting skin cancers you know, melanomas and various things like that. And the, truth be told, there are frequencies of UV light that will alter your DNA and RNA. But in nature, there's a balance. And so what happens is the UV will change your pH, will also produce nitro, natural vitamin D, which is very, very important. It's called a vitamin, but it really acts like a hormone in the body. It self, it regulates more than 30% of the bodily functions and systems I talk about. So there's 6,000 different systems and mechanisms going on. So having the, the proper amount of vitamin D, the FDA suggests it's 35 to, um, to 50 is the range for D3. But what we're finding in clinic is if you can get it to 85 to 100 in that range, then now we're going to be, again, changing your internal environment. It won't be a good, perfect storm for these microorganisms and these parasites and all that stuff. And it won't breed um, cancer and it won't breed um, many of the chronic ailments that people are experiencing. It's raising vitamin D level, right? That simple. But in Florida, wake up, you don't go out in the sun without slapping, you know, carcinogenic um, sunblocker on. And so they're, 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 directing the public to put something on their skin and a chemical that's going to make them sick 
not short term, long term using it. And it's going to block that early sun or that important sun that you need in order for your body to make vitamin D. So, so, so and can again, you talk more about sunlight and cancer? So it does not cause cancer well, the way that we think it does. Uh, it, I can't say that categorically. Some people, again, have genetic proclivities and um, tendencies. Uh, uh, overexposure to UV light can cause you can cause skin damage and caught can basically you know what i mean the truth is is that we all have cancer in us and we all have streptococcus and we all have pneumonia we all have all those organisms and all those cells in our body but the question is is why do some people get sick and symptomatic with cancer and some people don't like cancer is a, what they call an atypical cell it's a cell that's a mutant cell it's designed you build your you're producing trillions of cells every day just stati statistically some of them are going to be abnormal but the abnormal cells they just die off and you know they're replaced by good healthy cells but in some people they don't die off and they thrive and why is that it's because of their internal environment is 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 um conducive for these cells to thrive so go back to the discussion. How do we change our internal environment? So it's healthy for our bodies, but not healthy for cancer and not healthy for you know, chronic, chronic ailments. And I, I think that's where the focus is or should or might want to consider. So, Robbie, what the, what's, what's the, the protocol here? Um, is it sometimes sunblock if you're in the sun too much? Is it never sunblock? Like where, where's that, that, that like medium or what, 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 what do we do moving forward? Simple. First don't put any block on at all for the first, you know, maybe 30 to 45 minutes of sun exposure. Now, both of you guys, it looks like Alex, you're a little lighter skin than Dan. So the your skin color is produced by a skin cell that's called a melanocyte. And the melanocyte gets activated by UV light. And so when you go in the sun and the UV spectrum is present, it activates the skin color, your skin color. And so for you, Alex, if you stayed in UV light at, you know, for too long, you're going to start to get red, rosy and, and get sunburned, right? And then your burn will cool down and you're all of a sudden you're going to go from maybe a little bit of chalky peaked look and feel to a little bit healthier, more um, wholesome look, right? And that's just your skin color or that color of the melanocyte shifting. Now, what is that melanocyte doing? It's actually a natural sun blocker because Dan needs more sun than you do, Alex, to produce vitamin D. And, he, and that's because his skin color, like a dark skinned person, I, usually it's around 30 minutes. So Dan, you might need 45 minutes to get the same amount of, sun, of sunlight to get to produce the same amount of vitamin D3 that Alex needs. Right. Okay, so he might need 30, you might need 45. A darker skinned person might need maybe an hour of the same exposure to that sunlight to get the same amount of, it's about making vitamin D3. That's what the story is. Okay. Yeah. So, so um, the protocol for me is if you, I, you, Alex, the first half hour to 45 minutes, I go out in sunlight and have as much, most of my skin available to receive that sunlight to produce that vitamin D. Okay, and then I consider putting on a, a lotion of sort, but not the ones that are generally carried at, CB, at CVS or Walgreens that if you look at the label, the first five ingredients are chemicals that you would never want to have on your skin. Uh, okay, um, what you can do is produce a uh, and we have formulas, a formulation of a natural skin um, uh, blocker or sun blocker, and then you can put that lotion on or wear more clothing. I've actually seen some research that shows a connection between seed oils more so than the sun exposure, or perhaps it's the seed oils that you're consuming and how that's reacting with your cell membranes is then reacting to the sunlight and then causing that oxidative damage. Totally. Totally. Yeah. The mm -hmm. ROS is, yep, totally. It's no, there's no doubt. And, um, unfortunately most of the oils that are used in cooking and in like fried foods and packaged foods and so forth, uh, they're not necessarily the best oils um, for us to be adjusting. So, I mean, that's pretty advanced research, Dan. That was pretty cool to bring that up because the, 
that when you're when you've using an oil that's got a high level of trans fat in it uh, and or seed oil that's not necessarily conducive, um, then um, that it actually clogs the cells and it does clog the cell uh, membrane and it does um, it do, it is activated by sunlight UV light but not in a positive way in more of a negative way. Awesome. Since we're talking about sunlight, can we um, I guess start talking about what you mentioned earlier? photobiomodulation, which is a big word. I'm guessing just by breaking it down, photo meaning light, bio meaning body, that something to do with light and body. So can right. you talk to us about that? What is it? How do you do it? Sure. And modulation just means the shifting of those frequencies. The best way I could describe it is like a radio station. <clears throat> if you were dialed, <clears throat> if you dialed in 105, it might be rock and roll. If you dial in 107.5, it could be country rock. On uh, a radio station, every single dial is giving you a different type of music, per se, right? Every all those wavelengths. Same thing with sunlight. There are um, a cascade of frequencies within the sunlight spectrum. Most of them are invisible, by the way. The only ones that we can see is like the rainbow, and that's a very small segment of sun energy. Uh, the ones that are that people focus on, it starts really with um, with gamma rays and then uh, X rays, again these are used. Uh, gamma is hardly used, but but X rays are used in medicine. And the good story about that is, is there X rays are not good for us, period. But um, in today's world, because of computerization, they're able to use a very very small amount of X ray in order for you to get a, a diagnostic. And I think that part is really great because it's a good diagnostic but the x-ray part of it isn't. But now that we're using computers, we can really filter the amount of x-ray we're using to get the, the, the right diagnostic. And so I think that's good. Um, then you go to the UV spectrum, which we touched on, really super important for life on the planet, then the rainbow, and then infrared spectrum. So what happens is if you, like in nature, okay, so again, 8,000 years ago, we were hunting, guys are out in the field, you're out all day, basically exposed to the sun rays, right? Now, we don't have modern science statistics to know what the focus of amount of cancer was present in the populations 8,000 years ago. But I think that the biggest um, reason why people um, expired or people died then was either being eaten by an animal bigger than them or being warred upon by a nation that wanted to take up your territory. It wasn't cancer. It wasn't diabetes. It wasn't heart disease. These are all modern um, challenges that we're having. Okay, so so um, uh, in in light of that, uh, we have this shift. Okay, in the way that nature intended us to be, and how we were then, and how we are now, right? And uh, with as it comes to light frequencies. If you're out in the field all day, you're getting overexposed to UV frequencies that are in the earlier part of the of the morning. Usually, like I'm in Florida, so now it's between sunrise and around 11 in the morning, where UV is mostly present. And then, as the sun is turning and the and or the Earth is turning, uh, the UV spectrum starts to weigh, and then the infrared starts to come in. So that's from around 11 until dusk. So if you get overexposed and you and you get altered DNA and RNA from getting the wrong UV frequencies, it gets fixed by being in the IR, the infrared frequencies. Okay. The challenge in today's world is we get the UV, but we don't hang around long enough to get fixed with the IR. Okay. So so that's the balance. Now serendipitously our company what we discovered was the beauty of the healing powers of infrared the infrared spectrum and so we built an entire um, company around making devices that harness full spectrum infrared frequencies which are the healing repairing energies of sunlight and so for you that are, you might get the uv but don't get the ir or if you don't get enough sun exposure at all and you're just looking to detoxify and looking to repair your body, I'm delivering with our saunas and our on-body healing pads and the things we make, 
I'm delivering those beautiful frequencies into your home, into your life. So you can maintain your busy lifestyle, modern lifestyle, live in your apartment and so forth and do all your things. Um, and also get the, the um, natural energies you need in order for your body to self-regulate and to clean and to detox and do all those things. And that includes a vitamin D as well? No, um, infrared doesn't do the vitamin D part. That you would either have to do with light and or with some kind of supplementation like K2, D3 is a good one combination. And I like the, um, I like the liquid or the liposomal formats are the ones that are, get the, are the most bioavailable. Can you help break down these terms infrared? And then we also talk about red light therapy. Is that the same thing? What, like, can you break down the spectrum a little bit more? Sure. Okay. So, um, in the infrared spectrum, you have the near, the mid, and the far wavelengths. And then just before the near, you have green, purple, and red, and blue. And that's then, then just before that, you have the rainbow. That's visible light. So we see red light because it's still, it's six, six, it's measured in nanometers is the calibration. So around 600 nanometers is where red light is, is present. And then around, um, 700 or 800 is the invisible near infrared frequencies. So UV is invisible, natural rainbow light, some of the colors I mentioned, and then invisible infrared. That's the way it's sort of set up. So red light therapy and near infrared frequencies, basically most of the attributes and what people are raging on now about red light is really being um, augmented by the near frequencies, not that red 600 frequency per se. We use a red light in our own um, technology. We use frequency 663. It's very unusual and really expensive to produce. But that wavelength, just the difference between 660 and 663, that three, three nanometers can make all the difference in the way your body result, uh, reacts to it, right? And so, so um, the red light and the near frequencies, I'm going to lump them together. What they'll do is they'll, anything skin related, if you've got scars, tissues, if you've got acne, if you've got psoriasis, eczema, um, cellulite production, these are all the things that the near um, and the red lights will do. It also will um, support your mitochondria, which is your cell powerhouse. So that's super important. And the near frequencies will produce that, that natural gas we talked about earlier called nitric oxide. So you can get that from sunlight too, not just a supplement. That's another way to get to have your body produce it is by getting exposed to these near infrared. The mid, the mid is really a, a, a combination of both the near and the far. And so the, most of the science on infrared is about far infrared. Uh, that's about 100 years deep in terms of the science on it. The science on near infrared is probably maybe 10 years or, or so. Uh, bio photon modulation, bio, the body, photon light modulation is just the amplitude, either the, the power behind the light frequency or the light frequency itself. Okay, so that modulation, okay, that dial up or dial down can make all the difference in the result. So what we've experienced in our clinical approach is that the way that you sequence, the way that you, that you, the order that you do things in and the way you dose each of the things that you do can make the difference, a huge difference in the result. Okay. So like take um, sun gazing at the early part of the day and the late part of the day, it's perfectly cool, right? To do it. But if you did it in the middle of the day, you'd, your eyes would burn up, you know, so that wouldn't be cool. Right. So that's dosing, that's sequencing, the time of day and when, when you kind of build that into your routine so that the synergy of all these different kinds of hacks really get to stack up and create a much greater result than if you just did one by itself. Gotcha. Okay. Can we talk more about red light? Um, you mentioned a specific frequency. I've got the platinum LED right, right here. I love that. Okay. Which I think puts out seven different frequencies, anywhere from four 80 up to like 1060. I know there's different amounts of research for all these different right. wavelengths. You mentioned 663, like 
in your opinion, which are the best? Yeah, I, I like the system that you, there are a lot of interesting systems that are similar to what you have, have shown us. Um, the, um, okay, so breaking it down, um, they use what's called a wide band. So the um, bulb sits in a, in an aperture that is sort of a reflector that's sort of like that. And the bulb is here. And then, so as the light comes out, it bounces off the reflection and it creates sort of an, an array that's like that. And so that would be like a floodlight versus a spotlight where it just comes narrow band, where it just comes straight out and it's just focusing on a very specific place. That would be like a laser would be a narrow band. So that's one thing. The next thing is your device sits in a can. And so if you look at the instructions, it'll tell you stay eight inches away, stay 12 inches away and so forth. So the further the way, the further you get away from the light source, the lower the emissivity. Emissivity is the calibration used to determine how much light is actually getting into your cell. So you want a hundred percent emissivity. You want a hundred percent of that light energy coming through your skin and getting into your cell for you to get maximum result. The further you get away from the light source, the lower the emissivity. So ideally you want your body flush right against that, that can, if you can. But the challenge with that delivery system is that there are little fans behind the, each of those LEDs to keep the system cool. And those fans generate very high levels of electromagnetic fields, EMF. And so now your body's conflicted. Does it receive the beautiful nature of the spectrum, the near frequencies from, from the delivery system or protect itself against the EMF that that same system is generating? That's why it's telling you to stay eight inches away because it wants you to get some sunlight, but not get EMF. So the further you get away from the can, the further you get away from the EMF, but the, the lower the concentration of light energy that's coming into your cell. Remember, it's got to penetrate through your skin and through that thick layer, the subcutaneous layer of skin for it actually to get inside to start some things happening like restructuring your water, um, creating vasodilation, which is expanding veins and arteries so that we're improving blood flow, right? Your metabolism and your blood. That's an important thing because blood carries oxygen, nutrition, DNA, and RNA, you know? So if I can improve your blood flow, that's a good, that's a winning proposition long-term. And if I can increase the nutrition in your blood, winning proposition, if I can increase blood flow, nutrition, and oxygen in your blood, game in, game, game over. You're like right on, you're right on. So how do I manage all that? So anyway, back to your can. Um, we, we know all of this in our science. And so what we've done is we said, okay, how can I develop a delivery system that you can put right on your body so you get close to 100% emissivity or absorption of that light without EMF? So we created, we, we knew all of that. So we knew what the end game was, like you guys know what you want to do, like what you're trying to achieve. And so then we just kind of reverse engineer it and go back to the steps of what would that look like? And so that we're unique. You make it sound easy. Well, as a, um, as a device developer, that is, this is the way I think, I think about Robbie present. And I think about at the same time, I'm thinking about Robbie of the future. So I'm, I'm constantly dialoguing in my head right now. Like, what do we have currently? What are we dealing with in our environment? What is the challenges? What are the health trends? Why are they being caused? And how, how far are we away from nature? And then how can we reverse that by just creating some primal healing and get the body to do the heavy lifting like we started with in our first discussion? How do I reorient all of these variables that we're living in today's world so that we get our, so that we can be vital? and not be sick and, you know, be healthy to a less breath. Right. So back to some, back to light and the red light. So we developed a way that a non-body system that we call tri-light that you can just put right on your skin. And it has the 660 frequency and it has two near infrared. And the reason why we developed it is because we wanted to create a, a way to bring these light energies into the body, um, produce nitric oxide, which we know everyone's deficient on. We, we want to increase cell energy. That's your mitochondria. Uh, we want to increase blood flow and what then, and, and 
and also heal anything skin related. Again, scar tissue, stuff like that, like adhesions that come from scars, stuff like that. So that was our, that was our architectural profile. And then what did that look like was what we de developed called a trilight, which is very unique. We, we actually developed a, a diode, an LED light emitting diode that has three wavelengths in each diode. So what you have in your system is an array, like a cocktail, one row of 600 or 480s, one row of 600s, one row of 850s, one row of 980s. And then it's because it's a wide band, those wavelengths are mixing together, just like you mix a drink or a cocktail of a drink. Now you're mixing a cocktail of wavelength sunlight. Okay. It, you see the red or you see some colors in your system, but, um, I, I'm not saying anything disparaging about that company, but just in general, the industry, a lot of times bulbs are colored like food coloring. So people are expecting to see red light. So they need to give you a red light, but imagine that red light is invisible to your eye, but you're expecting a red light because the package on that side says red light therapy. It's really good for you. And you read all about it. If you didn't get a red light, then you'd think that there was something wrong, defective, right? Or right. So, so the light industry colors the bulbs to give the public what they're looking for, not necessarily give them the frequencies that they need in order for them to get, you know, as healthy as they could be. Um, anyway, we don't have any of those constraints here. We are a, uh, not a publicly held company. It's just my wife and I that were 23 or 24 years old now as a company. Um, so we've been at it for quite a while. We're a pretty trusted brand. Uh, because we don't compromise like anything, people over profit here. So we're interested in giving, delivering a, um, a value, value in our stuff, you know, good price, great technology that really does things. And it's all medically tested. Like our devices are listed with FDA as class two medical. So earlier I talked about how you can't trust agencies and all that. And in many cases, that's the case, but in the world of healthcare, and you probably guys probably have experienced this, the the company called FDA Food Drug Administration, they're considered the gold standard in terms of testing of medical and drug uh, drug devices or supplementation. That's globally, and so because as a company, early on, like twenty five years ago, <clears throat> we we from a business point of view, we wanted to leverage our research. Um, with the medical community. So I would get on stage, teach doctors about light biophoton modulation or light therapy or energy medicine. And, um, and they have their medical licenses basically on the line, right? And so in order for them to buy in, <clears throat> they have to know that the FDA is their agency is behind and has opined on the efficacy or the effectiveness of these devices. And we get a credential because of that. And that none of, not, all, well, not many of our competitors have gone that route because they didn't have to go that route. What we did was we took the longer road, the more expensive road, because we wanted to be able to um, teach these doctors how to employ this into their practice so that I could get on stage. And let's say, Dan, you had a practice in Manhattan and you saw 10,000 patients a year. I teach you about our technology. You see the benefit in proving the effectiveness of your protocols, pairing it up, right? Stacking those together. Now I've got one, I've taught one person, but I'm touching 10,000 lives potentially. Okay. So I thought that that was like, you know, the bees wax, right? That I thought that was the end. And then social media came in and uh, at the same time, you know, the pandemic hit. And so people were isolated. Uh, they were looking for different ways. They were looking for solutions. And we were a company that's been making solutions from right out of the gate um, to try to help. Well, it started with my daughter uh, that had Lyme disease, but then it became all chronic diseases. And, and we saw the benefit for everybody to be getting, you know, tuning into the healing powers of sun energy. You talk about the sun. Um, you didn't, and you, you mentioned like, you know, filtration to the ground. What, what are your thoughts on grounding? Oh, that's great. Grounding is one of the best things going and one of the cheapest therapies. Aside from laughter and fun, uh, I think grounding is right up there. 
So I'm a tree hugger. So you can see me, I hardly wear shoes. Uh, I want to touch the earth. So grounding is basically touching the earth or bringing earth charge into the body. Uh, <clears throat> there's a dear friend and colleague of mine named Dr. Jerry Tennant um, out of Dallas, Texas. And he's probably one of the founding pioneers of energy medicine. And uh, he talks about polarity and he talks and I and I I teach it because I am a student of his and we're in a mastermind together and uh, I love his body of work. And I think it's essential, particularly in the modern world. So because we don't touch the earth anymore, we don't really get the energy of the earth in our bodies to balance out our body battery. And so I'm going to try to keep this short. Each of our cells are like a little battery. So we have a positive charge and a negative charge. In order for our cells to communicate, remember, we get sick on a cell level, we heal on a cell level. So in order for our, to our cells to operate and for us to heal, the cells have to communicate. The only way they communicate on an optimal level is when they are a neutral charge, the same amount of negative to the same amount of positive. Now, in today's modern world, most of us, and I could say it categorically about you guys, myself included, we're more positively charged. And why is that? Because we're not getting energized by the earth, most of us, directly. And we are getting energized by positive charge particles that are called cations. So for instance, incandescent lights or air handlers, that's air conditioning and heating. When that air comes down the duct, okay, it's being pushed along a duct and it's gaining momentum and it's getting a charge, a magnetic charge to it, which is a positive charge. Now you're living and breathing in, in your home, in your apartment, in your car, and your body is immersed in positively charged particles. What do you think that's doing to your cell charge? It's shifting your cell charge to being more positive. What's the offset? A negative charge. How do you get a negative charge? From sunlight or from grounding, from touching the earth? Well, if you're not in the sun all day because it's winter and you're not grounded because you're not, you know, hugging trees and, you know, using grounding mats and that kind of technology, how do you get the negative charge into your body to balance out that battery? You don't. Okay, so your, bo your body battery is impaired. It's not holding a charge. So what does that mean? Like in the big picture. Well, what do you think runs your immune system? What do you think it runs your cell energy? It's like when you wake up in the morning and you might feel refreshed, but it's not, you, you get tired early. Well, why is that? Because your, bat your battery is not holding on to a charge. Like it's not fully charged. Starting out your day, because you didn't get a good night's sleep from the night before, and maybe you weren't sleeping on a grounding mat. And maybe when you wake up, you're in your heated home or your air conditioned home, and you're getting bombarded with these cations or the positive charge. So you're constantly being thrown off that way. I'm not even talking about electric cars, Bluetooth. I'm not even talking about that energy that also is moving you more towards being more positive charge. So earthing and getting the earth charge is essential. I mean, it's essential. I can't get more powerful than that in order for our bodies to be balanced, okay? And so um, Dr. Tennant talks about uh, polarity and that's an important concept. And so imagine, you, you guys ever have a, um, you ever use rechargeable batteries at all, right? Yeah. Okay, so you, I know that, you know, Dan, I, you, you, you had a challenge with a battery on your camera did, and yeah. stuff like that, so you'd go charge it up, right? Yeah. All right, now, if, if you know, like you see battery chargers and then you put in your double A's or your triple A batteries and it sits in a little device and then there's like red lights and then they turn green when it's fully charged. Right. Right. And then you pull it out. Well, if you deplete that battery down to no charge, which happens, I mean, you imagine depleting a cell that's just in your normal day. Now, that's not even talking about if you're sick, if you have a chronic challenge, you're, you have another drain. If you've got, you know, microbes in your body, parasites and all that, they're pulling your body charge also. They're using that energy too, right? So there, that's called a um, energy stealer. So you've got these stealers, like your body function is a stealer. These parasites are stealers. And then you have, um, you have your um, energy providers. That's the sun or the earth. Okay, or a grounding mat, grounding technology. 
So that's the that's what we're dealing with in terms of the equations. Now, now um, back to Dr. Jerry Tennant's work. He discovered that you need uh, on twenty millivolts of charge in your cell for it to operate healthy. If your cell is under duress or stress or being bombarded with pathogen or a parasite, you need fifty millivolts of charge. Okay. Okay. Now, if your body, if you take that battery and you drain it down completely or the cell drain with it, where there's no charge in the cell, the polarity of that cell flips. So the positive charge now becomes negative and the negative becomes positive. If you take a battery, the same rechargeable battery put into your battery recharger, which is our body, a body is a battery recharger. And the, um, the earth, the earth and the sun are, are the sources that are charging that battery up. And you put it that same battery that's the polarity has been flipped. It will go from red to green and you'll see that green light. You pull that battery out and you go put it into your camera or go to use it or your flashlight. It won't work because even though it looks like it's charged, it hasn't held any charge because the, um, because the polarity has been flipped. And that's the challenge with today's world. And actually, it's one uh, one thing we discovered about a year ago that's really rocked my world in terms of clinic, because I never tested people's polarity before. I gave them in a, an intervention, and it always I always wondered why. Sometimes you can give somebody a protocol and it really works. Sometimes it works a little bit. Sometimes it doesn't work at all, or it works for a little bit and then it then it just stops working. Well, why is that? what changed and i discovered what it is is polarity like you if you try to charge a battery that's that got a flip polarity it won't work if i try to charge your cell and that cell's polarity flipped it'll look like it's charging i'll give you sunlight i'll give you earth energy but then you go to go for a run and you're exhausted because your cell's polarity is off so what i do now is i test your polarity first and then i flip your polarity so that if you're positive, so that your positive charge side is properly installed. And then I charge you up with sun or with earth. And then I do my intervention. And now I'm seeing in my clinic, oh, maybe 30 to 40% better results, more sustainable wow. results. How are you testing polarity? Um, you can do it. You can muscle test using kinesiology. You can use Dr. Tennant. Talk, teaches and talks about a, um, it's called a pendulum. I don't know if you guys are familiar with pendulums. I've seen it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you could take, you could, this is a pendulum right here. And then if you hold the pendulum, if it's moving, if the pendulum moves in a clockwise fashion, then you've got positive polarity. If it moves in a counterclockwise, it's negative. So well, if you I- just blew my, my mind. My friend used to do that to me and I, I would laugh. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's for real. I mean, seriously, for real. Yeah, that's so, great to know. So now how do you, so if you have negative polarity, how do you charge somebody or flip the polarity or what, what, what's the next you need step to, after that? You need to use what's called square wave or scalar wave technology. It's very simple. Um, it's found in nature, but there are devices and pendants and things that you can wear that actually generate a square wave. And so if you had that pendant on, you probably heard of scalar technology. It's a hack. So if you have like a, a band that you wear or a pendant that you wear that generates a scalar wavelength, <clears throat> then it's pretty much constantly flipping your polarities so that you can receive the uh, earth or receive the negative ion or the earth charge properly. The reasons why fl polarity flips are things that we know already, like um, emotional distress or uh, dental profiles. So if you have a root canal, if you have a challenge there, or if you have pathogens, or if you have um, emotional challenges, these are all reasons that polarities can flip. Okay, so so if you use scalar energy, flip the polarity the other way, charge the cell up, then do your intervention. Now you're moving everything in the positive direction. That gives you a whole lot of time to go after that root cause, like fixing your root canal or change or fixing your stress in your life or your emotional challenges. So you, you're getting your life back and you can reorient yourself so that you have a more sustainable profile.
I want to finish up the grounding topic. Um, what are your thoughts on things like this, these grounding mats that are connected to outlets? Yeah, um, I like it. It's a lot of concerns yeah. about them, perhaps picking up uh, dirty electricity or things like that. Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, you can you can measure the dirty electricity with a with a simple voltmeter, so you can know that right away. Um, I think it's better than nothing, but the but the um, supposition or presupposition is that the the uh, socket that you're plugging that device into is grounded itself. So what it's doing is, you know, like you've got like two, three plugs, three prongs, and the round prong is tapping into the grounding uh, in the socket. Now, if you're living in a in a newer building, like 15 or 20 years old or younger, most probably by code, that that grounding plug has to actually be wired into your circuit board that ultimately gets wired to a, with a copper wire to a stake that goes is driven about 18 inches into the ground. OK, so it's touching the earth. The earth charge is coming through that wire and it's basically going into every socket that's attached to that circuit um, wow. and bringing earth charge to that little round plug. Now you plug in your device and it, I think that your device probably has two fake plugs it does, and yep. then one they're plastic, real yeah. one. Right. So they're not looking for the electrical side of it. They're just looking for the grounding side. If there is dirty electricity or poorly, um, uh, poorly um, insulated wires within anywhere in that network. Now you've got magnetic fields that are coming from these wires that are inside the wall <clears throat> that are now affecting the, the socket that that same grounding mat is going to pick up that charge as well as the earth charge. So now you're delivering some bad stuff and some good stuff. Now you can easily buy I think at a hardware store for 15 bucks, you can buy a simple. I've actually got one in the closet. Yeah, right so you, can, yeah. you can test you, the voltmeter and see how do you, or not. How do you uh, properly test with the voltmeter? Well, uh, I have to see your device, but I can show you off camera if you want. I didn't even have a chance to talk to you, and I guess it'll be part two where I, we've, we're actually about to release our, um, an entirely new division, which is vibrational medicine. Um, in vibrational medicine, it's kind of um, taking like, uh, this is a, um, a carbon fiber card that's seven layers thick. And I don't know how well you can see it, but that's 18 karat gold. There's some sacred geometry, but there's 220 frequencies programmed into this card. And when you hold this on your body, I'm now bringing all of those frequencies into my field. Yeah. We've got to talk more about that. I know Nikola Tesla had a, a purple plate that he embedded frequencies into, yeah. um, Alex this has been a major question of Alex and I because I wear some stuff. I don't really know how it works. Let me see. Love, that. Since you're a creator, see your band. Um, I've got this. This is some Shungite. This is got from it. a company called Life Harmony. Yeah, got and it. And I don't really know what the deal is. So, as someone who's actually created it, we'd love to talk about the tech oh, behind yeah. it and how. Part two. Part two I'm yeah. an expert on this. But but as I've been grooming myself in in my own technology and moving along we had an uh, initial sort of idea concept and then it sort of just was serendipitous things presented themselves people presented themselves and our own interest in moving towards more natural healing you know was a big piece for us that just brought us to today so um yeah there's a lot of we became, I call myself a generalist because we're an expert on water, we're an expert on air, we're an ex expert on light energy. We've just had to learn all of these things because they're all the elements that we um, employ in creating that primal healing and what we see as the real solution to uh, today's challenges. Well, thank you for your time. We awesome. appreciate this it. It's so good. Yeah, we'll still... talk about this next time. We can maybe film it and you can walk me through a whole tutorial on how to measure yeah, properly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yeah. um, we can use that on your skin, but we also use that to, um, when in dental, in dental work, you can hold one electrode and put the other one on a tooth and you can actually determine whether that tooth is dead or alive. So like with root canals uh, and so with biological dentists, it's very important that you 
this is not my work. It's the work of Hal Huggins, who invent, who discovered or developed or started the movement on biological dentistry. Um, <clears throat> that if you move remove the diseased tooth, okay. So each of your teeth sit on energy meridians. That's TCM, traditional Chinese medicine, right? Yep. And so if you have a root canal that's sitting on an energy meridian that feeds to your kidney or your heart, and then all of a sudden you've got, you know, like a kidney disease or you've got breast cancer, you can remove the root canal and then the cancer goes away because it's block that's sitting on that energy meridian it's blocking it. And so how does a dentist decide, like when he takes a picture of your mouth, and he goes, well, you've got seven cavities and you've got one root canal. Like, how does he decide the roadmap of what he's going to do first? Which tooth is he going to work on? What part of your mouth is he going to work on first in, in his game plan? You can take that voltmeter and you can just test all the teeth. And whichever one is the, is the um, most dead or the least has the least amount of energy is the, is the, the first one you go for. Mm, wow. Pretty amazing, right? Interesting. Yeah. That is okay. incredible. All right. More stuff. Very cool. Great guys. Oh, man, more to come. Thanks yeah. so much.